Good morning, Lighthouse Church. Is it good to be here this morning? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Is this sounding good? It's very loud. Okay, cool. But that's all right. Uh, I know they're doing their job there in the in sound box. They seem to be busy this morning, but that's all right. They need to, to be uh, tested on their skills here this morning, I see. First of all, I want to say, according to the watch right now and the temperature, it's eight degrees Celsius outside. So first of all, I want to say to each and every one of you, well done. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. Come on. Well done. It's cold today. You came to church. You are amazing. You are really amazing. So well done to each and every one of you here this morning. And uh, I must just say, I am so gripped by the, by the series we're in and, and, and the fact that we're preaching through the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to go through this amazing series. And, and I really just, I'm, I'm standing up here this morning and I'm saying, I've got so much to say in so little time. And I'm saying, Lord, help me. Help me here this morning. And so I want to start off first by praying. It's a good place to start. And then we're going to let loose here this morning. Amen. So Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place here right now. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. I ask, Lord, that you would come and cause eyes to be opened. I pray this morning in faith this morning, that eyes would be opened to a truth from your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to reveal something of a reality that we as a church are to step into this morning. I thank you, Lord, for revelation here this morning. I commit this time to you now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So, like I've mentioned, this series has opened up my eyes quite considerably. You know, I've been, I've been saved for over 30 years now, and I've always heard of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it's always been love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, all these awesome things that the fruit of the Spirit is. And I've realized as we've preached through it, as, as Heinz preached through it, as... as, as I've, I've preached on love, and Philip preached on, uh, what did he preach on again? I'm asking. Joy. And Thomas preached on peace, right? Hein preached on all the others up until now. Well done, Hein. But I've realized these are solid, hardcore things. And I've realized something. You know, when I look at this picture, this picture's been up from day one. And I looked at it about two or three Sundays ago when Hein ministered. I looked at this picture and I thought, whoever made this picture, you gifted. You've got a gift from God because it's a picture of the church right now. It's a picture of the church right now. And I, and I looked at this and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And so I want to I do an illustration, but I'm going to need your help this morning. Are you, are you going to help me out this morning? Can we just loosen up a little? All right, can I ask us all please just to stand? You're part of the illustration. You're part of the illustration this morning, all right? It's cold, it's good to stand up, get the blood flowing, right? So there we have a picture of a tree, right? So I want every one of you, come on, just please, please just work with me here this morning, all right? Are you gonna work with me this morning? Church, you with me? Yeah, good, good. All right, so I want you to please make like a tree. Come on, guys, make like a tree. Come on, you do it. we're all different. Make like a tree. Here's if I could just take a photograph right now. It would be great, all right? Make like a tree. Now, uh, no, don't put your arms down. Come, my arms are still up, so your arms are up too. Now, bear fruit. Bear fruit, guys. Come on, I'm trying. Are you trying as hard as I am? Come on. Ah! Okay. All right, you can be seated. Yeah, oh, that was good. That was good. Well done. Well done, church. There's a reality in the picture that we can see up there this morning. There's a big reality. 
Because there's a tree there, there's a lot of leaves and there's a lot of fruit. And the tree has a stem and it goes down to some roots. And those roots are sunken into some soil where there's nourishment. This morning I want to tell you, and I want to tell you church, I'm telling you as an individual, but I'm telling you as a church this morning, you cannot do any fruit unless you're connected to the source. You cannot bear any fruit unless you're connected and you have the Holy Spirit as your source. We are preaching a series called The Fruit of the Holy Spirit. We as ourselves, as a church, cannot bear any fruit unless we're connected to the source. And in so many times, we're trying our best to produce fruit. And when you look at that picture, look at that little white line there in the middle of the stem. Look at that little white line in the middle of the stem. So many times, we're wanting to give love. We're wanting to give true joy. We're wanting to give, give out the fruit of the Spirit. But we've been cut off somewhere in the middle. We've been cut off somewhere in the middle. And God is saying, would you please connect with me? Can I be your source? And as I've been sitting in that chair and I've been listening to the preachers that have been coming out, every single time I look at that picture and I'm thinking to myself, Lord, I want to be connected to the source. Because when I do this, while I'm concentrating on being part of the source, oh, wow, look what happened. I have fruit. There's fruit in my life. There's fruit in my life. And this morning, this is my intro. We're preaching on the fruit of the Spirit. We're preaching on the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is not possible unless you are rooted in the source, which is the Holy Spirit, God the Father. Amen? Amen. And so we need to be here this morning. We need to know how do we get rooted in to the Holy Spirit. Because the whole series is useless unless it comes from the Holy Spirit. The source is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the more we learn about God, the more we learn about His character. Why? Because if we're bearing fruit, it means we're bearing something of Him. If you're rooted in Him, it's His character that comes out as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Wow. Leon, but this is just the intro. Oh, you've started preaching already. This is the intro. Church, I want to tell you something. Don't be disconnected from God, His Holy Spirit. Because as we preached on love, as we preached on joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, as we preach on every one of these, I've realized something. The lights have come on in my head as being these are the character, the character traits of our God. Every single nine of the fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, every one of these aspects are actually the character of God. And the more we connected in with Him, the more His character comes out in our lives. And that's my revelation about this series. And this morning is no exception. We're going to be, the title of this morning's preach is faithfulness. It's faithfulness. And you know what? God is a, is a promise-keeping God. He is a God who makes promises and He keeps His promises. Why? Because God is faithful. Each and every one of the preachers that we've had, God is love. The joy of the Lord is our strength. God is actually joy. God is peace. He's the Prince of Peace. These character traits come out. Patience. God is patience. Kindness. Goodness. God is faithfulness. God is faithful this morning. And this morning, I want to bring out this aspect of faithfulness. What is the definition of faithfulness? It's to be steadfast, steadfast loyal, steadfastly loyal, steadfast loyalty. It means continuously devoted into what God has called you into and what he's called us into as a church. Amen? And so the first point that I want to climb into here this morning is quite plain and simply the fact that God's demonstration of faithfulness. We cannot have faithfulness come out of us as children of God if God himself isn't faithful. 
And so this morning, I want to read a portion of Scripture that's very real and that demonstrates God's faithfulness. Exodus chapter 12. We're going to read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. And as we read through it, I want us, I'm going to read it through like I normally do. And I'm going to read it through in such a way that we're going to understand the Scripture this morning. Verse 21, it says, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once. And select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. All right. This is the time of the, of the plagues, right? In Egypt, remember there was Moses going up to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. God saying, I want my people to be let go, right? So Moses goes up to Pharaoh and he says, let the children of Israel go. Let Israel go. And he says, no. No, I'm not going to do that. And so we go through these nine plagues. We've heard about them all. We've read about them all, the locusts and the blood, water turning to blood, all these different plagues that, that were brought on to Egypt so that God, God's people could be let go, so that they could go to the promised land. And so we come after the ninth one, after the ninth plague is done, and Pharaoh's heart is still hardened and, and what happens? Moses says, all right, here comes the next one. And he sends those guys out. This is the portion of scripture that we're reading for the 10th plague. And it says, take a branch of hyssop, hyssop, dip it into blood. You can do a study on hyssop. It's a massive, awesome thing. Dip it into blood in the, in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. What was happening here was the Israelites had to kill, go and kill the Passover lamb. They had to take the blood, which was in a basin, and they had to dip the hyssop into this blood, and they needed to paint. So they used the hyssop as a paintbrush, right, with the blood. This is what's happening. So they go, and they dip the blood, and they put it on the top. They put it on the side, and they put it on the left side and the right side, and they put it on the top, right? This is what we're reading in God's Word. And it says there, none of you shall go out from the door of your house until morning. Once they've done this painting of the door frame. When the, Lord, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame. And he will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So God said to the Israelites, go and do this. Why? So that the destroyer will pass over your house. Hence the word pass over. Amen? Verse 24, it says, Obey these instructions as a last ordinance for you and your descendants. Then you, when you enter the land that the Lord has given you as a promise, observe the ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared the homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. I want to tell you something here this morning. There's an obedience from the children of Israel to go and get the lamb, slaughter the lamb, put the blood in the bucket and do the painting. There was also another instruction. They needed to stay in their houses and not come out. Because the destroyer, it says there, the destroyer, am I right? And he, in verse 23, it says then, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame, and he will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. It was a promise. And so all the firstborn of the whole land of Egypt were struck down were struck down, right? And they died. Those that didn't have the blood. What did that signify? I want to ask you this morning, what did that signify? The salvation that comes through the blood of Jesus. From that time already, way back there in Egypt, when the Israelites were in Egypt, there was a prophecy. There was a prophecy. There was an action that already confirmed the fact that Jesus is coming. Why? Because the destroyer has come to destroy me and to destroy you. And if there's no blood, 
If there's no blood on your doorpost, the destroyer come on and will come and kill you. This morning, Hein got up here and he said, if you know Jesus Christ, if you don't know Jesus Christ, respond. Respond and come to the front. Why? Because we want to see the blood painted on your doorposts of your life so that the destroyer doesn't come and destroy you. Amen? And after the meeting, there will be an opportunity. I know there will be an opportunity. If you're sitting here this morning, I've got good news for you. Jesus died for you. He died on the cross for you so that you do not perish, so that you do not perish. Matthew 26 verse 28 says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When he did that, this was the time when he, he did communion with his, with his disciples. It was his blood. Right from the start, we already are remembering those things that happened. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you were a sinner, he died for you. He said, I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how ridiculous your life has been. He says, I've died for you. And my blood, my blood has been shed for you. And the destroyer will not come into your house and destroy you if you accept me. Amen? Wow. Because God's word is true. We can take confidence this morning. The simple act, 2,000 years before Jesus even arrived, the simple act of painting doorposts was a prophecy of what Jesus came and did for us. And I want to tell you this morning, God is faithful to his word. We read God's word. Nats, can you give me my Bible there, please? We read God's word. And I want to tell you something now. Everything in God's word, thank you. Everything in God's word is true. I want to tell you something. You can read this book and it'll tell you things. And where there's promises of God, where there's things that God has done, where he saved the Israelites, where Noah got into the boat and flooded the world. You go read about it in God's word. And God says, I promise I will never, ever flood the earth again like that. And I'll show you by sending the rainbow. I'm a promise keeping God. I'm a faithful God. And so when we talk and we, we, we re reference the fruit of the Holy Spirit, God is, God's character is faithfulness. And when we are rooted into God and His Holy Spirit, faithfulness is a fruit that comes out in our lives, in the way we live. And so we, we open God's Word, we can believe what God's Word says, and we can know, because He is faithful, I can be faithful. Church, are you hearing the message this morning? Bullet point number one for us to learn about tonight or today is the fact that God has demonstrated faithfulness because it's part of his character. Get rooted into, his, into him and that character will come out. Amen? Point number two. Point number two is our demonstration of faithfulness. Because God is faithful, we can be faithful. Amen? You with me? We cannot have faithfulness unless God said in, uh, has that in his character himself. We wouldn't have been able to produce that fruit. Amen? But we can. Point 2.1. Point All right, if you're writing notes, there's a, there's a point two, and then there's now two bullet points under 2.1, right? So the first one is generosity. Generos generosity. Okay, and I want us to read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. It says, now he, who's he? It's God, right? Jesus, okay. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge. You see that word? Enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I want to tell you something. We met as some elders just the other day and we had Marcus from Cornerstone Church here and he spoke with us and he shared some prophetic, some prophetic word for us that we as a church are, are, are entering a building stage. As a church, we're entering a building stage. 
What does that mean? And as soon as, while I was sitting in that meeting, I had a picture that was identical to the picture I got in one of the prayer meetings when the guys left for Malawi, just before they left for Malawi. I had a picture that their cars were full of sacks, sacks of seed, full of sacks of seed. And I was like, how is this connected with building, Lord? How is this connected with building? Because God says, I've given you seed. He has given you seed. I want to read that again. For he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store. God has supplied us with seed. What do you do with seed? Do you keep it in the store? You can't keep it in the store. It's not going to do anything there. You've got to take the seed and you've got to throw it. And you've got to sow it on fertile soil. You don't just throw it on a tar road. It's going to die there. You sow it where there's proper soil for it to grow. And when you take the seed and you sow it, it means God saying, revealing to me the fact that we need to be generous. We need to be generous in it. Why? Because if we're entering into a time of building, God is saying, I want you to be increased. Your space is too small, right? Your influence, your spheres of influence are too small. I need you to start sowing seed. And seed can come in many various forms, shapes and sizes. And in many cases, you can broaden it or, or narrow it down rather to three main things. It's your time, your talent, and it's your treasure. How generous are we being with the seed God has given us? God has given us time. He's given us our talents, and He's given us our treasures. And I feel this morning God is saying, take the seed. The picture I had when the guys went to Malawi was these sacks of seed to be taken out of their cars and sown and sown into Malawi so that people can have increase and God's kingdom can have increase. I want to tell you something this morning. God has given you seed. He's given you time. He's given you talent. How are you faithfully using the time, your talent, and your treasure for his kingdom. Amen. I'm asking you that question. I've already said to you, well done for being here this morning. It's eight degrees Celsius, and you're here this morning. Well done. Already your time and your commitment's there to be here this morning. Amen. Guys, you hearing me? Faithfulness is the key to increase. Faithfulness is a key to increase. I want to encourage you this morning to be faithful in generosity, in your generosity. Because also God is saying in the, in the, in the talents, I've preached on this before, it says, Matthew 25 verse 21, it says, His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. God wants to increase you. That he'll increase you based on, on your generosity. You took five talents, you made another five talents. Well done. I'll, in, I'll increase more. He has another five talents. I've increased you. God wants to increase you. I want to tell you something. With your finances, how generous are you? God wants to increase. The seed cannot stay in the storehouse. You need to sow it. Amen? It's very quiet, eh? What's happening here this morning? The next point under point number two is stewardship. And I, Hein has done an amazing job in preaching on stewardship in, in, in the Healthy Church series that we had. And I want to just reiterate this aspect of our stewardship, faithfulness in our stewardship. 1 Peter 4 verse 10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. In various forms. <laughs> Faithful stewards. You know, recently South Africa played in the World Cup. Am I right? We, who, who watches rugby here? Let's just get a show of hands. Anyone watch rugby around here? Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. Especially the Springboks. Man, we can brag about the rugby because the, we, we kind of, we kind of the world champs, right? Eh? Come on. And, and we won the World Cup, guys. All right, it's cool. That's really cool. In Rugby World Cup 2024, we won the final. South Africa versus New Zealand. The traditional, the traditional 
challenge of all challenges. And in the final, in the 73rd minute of the final, what happened? Do you guys remember what happened? There was a yellow card. There was a yellow card in the 73rd minute. There's only 80 minutes in the game, right? So in the last seven minutes, there was a yellow card. There was a yellow card. And when you get a yellow card, it means you have to be off the field for 10 minutes. And one of our guys, Cheslin Colby, man, he's my hero. I love this guy, really. When he gets the ball, you know, ooh, something's going to happen now. Something amazing's going to happen. But he gets this opportunity to, in, to try to do an intercept pass, intercept a pass from one of the, the New Zealand team guys to another guy, and he knocks it on. And obviously, when you knock on an interception, it's a forced knock on. And what happens is it's a yellow card because it's a foul. It, you stopped a movement that could have happened where they could have scored a try. You stopped the flow of the game. And so Cheslin Colby got a yellow card. And there he is there on the next slide. On the next slide. You got Cheslin Colby. You got a yellow. Guys, he's bad, man. It's bad. It's a bad situation, right? And what happens there? <laughs> and when that happened, I looked at my TV and I said, Cheslin! They need you. The team needs you, but but you know what? I've I've printed I've printed here, and I'm going to read for you a, the, a report where they interviewed Cheslin after after the game about what happened here, and says the box superstar Cheslin, who was shown a yellow card for a deliberate knock-on in the 73rd minute against the All Blacks, could barely watch as his teammates hung on grimly to secure the 12-11 the win while he was sitting on the sideline. Cameras, cameras spotted the 30-year-old pulling his jersey over his head, and he eventually turned his back on the action as, all, as it all became too much for him. There he is there. Pulled his jersey over his head. I mean, this dude, he's the most committed guy on the team. Man, he's the smallest guy on the team, and he bounces the biggest guys off him. He's there next to him with his jersey pulled over his head. Receiving a yellow card, this is what he says now. Receiving a yellow card in the World Cup final is disappointing, Colby told the reporters. I was more disappointed. I was more disappointed because I let the whole nation down. There he is. There. He, he says, I, I let the whole nation down. I let my teammates down at the, at the time, looking up at the clock, knowing that I was not going back onto the field. I just went and sat on the chair. I pulled the jersey over my head, and I was crying and praying at the same time. I was crying and I was praying at the same time. I want to tell you something. Rugby is one of those games. I played rugby. Any of the guys here play rugby at high school, whenever you played rugby? I played wing in grade 11 for the first team. I was one of the smaller guys in the team, and I was fast enough to be on the wing. And I played wing. I played this guy's position. And when the scrum is on the certain side of the field, the left wing that Cheslin Colby is playing is on the blind side. And if you, there's no one there, there's a whole open space of field that the enemy can attack. That the enemy, that the opponent can grab the ball, do a blind side maneuver, and your whole team is on the back, uh, on the back foot. You are, you're pedaling backwards, you're defending for your life. I want to tell you something here this morning, church. Are you sitting on the sideline when you should be on the field? This point I'm making is your stewardship. God has given you a gift. God has given you a gift and he's called you to be on the team. The team needs you. But what have you done? What are you doing that you're next to the field and you're not playing in your position? 
Because the, what happens is when someone gets taken off and it's such a vital position, they put someone else that's in a position, that's a specialist in their position, and they put it in your position. And he doesn't, he's not fast enough. He's not agile enough for that position. And they run circles around that person. And that's what happens when, when you get a yellow card, they call it the sin bin. <laughs> right? Guys, we cannot allow ourselves to be caught in the sin bin because the team needs you. The team needs you. And I want to say something here this morning. The team needs you, guys. Church, if you are in the sin bin, you are not where you should be. If you are off the field, you are not where you should be. I want us to read 2 Samuel 11, verse 1 to verse 5. It says, in the spring of the year, this is David, it's talking about when David, this whole portion of scripture is about him. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, it's the time where kings go out to battle. David is the king of Israel, right? It's spring has come, it's the time where kings go out to battle. The word of God is very clear on it. David said, sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. David remained in Jerusalem. Where was he meant to be? He was meant to be in battle. David was in Jerusalem. Verse 2, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her and he came to her and he came and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. I am pregnant. Where was David meant to be? He was meant to be on the battlefield where kings are meant to be on the battlefield, winning the war, winning for the kingdom, winning for Jesus. But he decided to stay in Jerusalem. And what happened? He ended up in the sin bin. He slept with a woman he wasn't married to. It's called fornication. Do not sleep with people you are not married to. Sorry, I just had to say that. Church, we can disqualify ourselves by not being a good steward in God's kingdom. We can disqualify ourselves. God has called you to be a good steward, steward of what he has given you. He's given you time. He's given you talents. He's given you treasures. And God is saying, don't get caught up in places where you shouldn't be. If you get caught up in places you shouldn't be, you find yourself in the sin bin where you need to wait 10 minutes and that game's already over after 10 minutes. You're gonna miss your chance to make an impact in God's kingdom. You're gonna miss your chance to score a try for the kingdom. And the team could lose because of you. Cheslin Colby was next to the field. And I said, when he went off the field, I said, Cheslin, the, peep, the team needs you. I'm saying to you this morning, whatever your name is, Saying good stuff. I'm saying hi. Saying what your name is. The team needs you. The team needs you on the field because there's a gap there. Be faithful in what God has given you. Your gifts, your talents. I want to say there are people here this morning that are sitting with gifts. With absolute amazing gifts for God's kingdom. And you saying I'm going to sit next to the sideline. I'm going to sit next to the sideline. There's drummers here. I've got a list here. There's drummers here that know how to drum. They know how to sit there and they know how to hit those drums. I want to say, stop sitting next to the sideline. 
There's guitarists sitting there, here, listening to me online. You should be up here on stage being faithful with God, what God has given you. There's life group leaders here saying, ah, uh-uh, ah, uh-uh. it's not for me. I want to say you've just put yourself in the sin bin. You're in a place where you shouldn't be. There are people here this morning that should be teaching at Kids Zone. Why? Because you're going to make an impact in those young people's lives. You're going to score tries for the kingdom of God. But you've decided to put yourself next to the field in the sin bin. <laughs> Soup kitchen. It's people who know how to serve. There's people here that know how to serve in what you're good at. In what you're good at, you know how to do it, but you've decided to put yourself next to the field. Guys, I want to say, can you get rooted into Jesus? Can you get rooted into Jesus because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is faithfulness? God wants you rooted in His Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is going to say to you, hello, I need you on the field. I need you to bear fruit. I need you to be faithful on the field. The team needs you. The Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning. I know He is. I don't get given a message like this for no reason. And I'm going to encourage you this morning to be faithful with that gift and that calling God's got for you. Number three, point number three, is God rewarding faithfulness. Proverbs 3, verse 3 to 4 says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor, favor, and a good name in the sight of God and man. Faithfulness will always bring increase, guys. Faithfulness will always bring increase. But faithfulness is the key to God's favor as well. Faithfulness. Faithfulness means steadfast loyalty. It means consistently devoted to what God has called you to do. This morning I told you, well done for being here this morning. You know what? God's called you to be here this morning. He's called you to be here. What were you doing today? You got up. It was cold. You got dressed. You made the effort. Why? Because you were faithful. Well done. But there's more. There's more. Because you could be sitting here with this amazing gift the team needs. Amen. When God sees consistency in you producing one of his character traits, faithfulness, he will favor you. He will pour out favor on you. Do you know that in your workplace, if you're faithful in your job, in the roles and the responsibilities that you do, and you do not waver in what your roles and responsibilities are, God says in his word that is true, his word that is true, says you will get favor in front of God and man. You will be favored in your job. I want to encourage you this morning, be faithful in your job. Do your job as if you are doing it straight for the Lord. Because then you will see favor. Why? Not because Leon said it, because God's word says it. Guys, we need to be very, very committed to the faithfulness. This fruit of faithfulness, you will produce it. But once again, I'm saying to you, are you rooted in the Holy Spirit? Are you rooted in the source that God has given you, poured out upon you? It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you need to be plugged into it. Then you'll produce it. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Can you bow your heads? We worship you, Lord God. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you for your word that is true. We thank you, Lord, that in everything we do, Father, that we can be faithful in what you have given us. Lord, we repent this morning where you have given us things and we've said, I'm going to sit next to the sideline instead. We repent of that this morning. I feel there's a repentance this morning. Just as I'm standing here this morning, I just feel it's just between you and God. No one will know what you're praying unless you want to pray it out. But I feel there's a, there's a, there's an, there's a genuineness between you and God this morning. Lord, you've given me this thing and I've pushed it aside. You've given me this gift and I've pushed it aside. You've given me this resource 
and I've pushed it aside. You've made me wealthy and I've pushed it aside. This morning I feel it's just between you and God. Just say sorry. Just say sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. And Lord, I pray that as there's, there's genuine repentance, I pray now, Lord God, for a change. I pray for a change. Lord, that we don't throw things away that you've given us. Lord, we want to be faithful with what you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. I pray for those people that are here this morning that are disconnected from you, that are trying to bear fruit, but are disconnected. They're cut in the middle. The stem is, is broken. There's no link to you. I pray for restoration this morning. I pray, Lord God, for each and every one of us to have a personal relationship rooted in your spirit this morning. And that, Father, just by being rooted in, will produce the fruit of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your character that you do first. You do first. You have produced these things, these character traits as we read through your word. You have done these things. And from us, just being rooted in you, we'll produce the same because it's you. We glorify you. We honor you. We praise you this morning. You are a faithful God. You are a faithful God. Come Holy Spirit, come and work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.